we farm about 5,000 acres and have transitioned 1,500 acres into organic. Um, part of that will be this year and then the other half will be next year. We grow a pretty diverse rotation. We grow wheat, oats, corn, barley, soybeans, lentils, peas, canola, flax, and we do a lot of cover crops as well. Um, and a lot of that we actually do in an intercrop setting as well. Um, and I would say, what are the biggest questions for organic, as an organic producer about the regenerative movement? How do I reduce or my tillage or go to no-till? And I think that's probably the biggest issue, but I think that we maybe focus on it too much. And I think there's a lot of good we can do with the quality of inputs we put into the soil through the root systems on the organic side. Um, is the regenerative movement taking away from the organic value proposition? I don't think so. I think what it's doing is it's helping revolutionize what the food system, uh, or how the food system thinks about its grain production and its food production. And hopefully in the long term that will actually break the system. And that's why I've kind of put that quote there at the bottom. You never change things by fighting the existing reality. To change something, you build a new model that makes the existing model obsolete. So I hope that the regenerative movement is going to change the food system fundamentally. And do we need to integrate livestock? I think it definitely helps, but I think there's a lot of ways that we can kind of transition through that period with, and do organic successfully without it. And is there enough time to grow fall cover crops? I think there is, and there's just a few techniques we have to take into account to make that happen. The philosophy on our farm is really just being to increase and feed biology and build a good ecosystem in order to build our soil and increase profitability. We want to reduce tillage, so always only shallow tillage, aerate the top part of our soil. We want to do early seeding and have constant cover. So seed extremely early so that later on in the season we can put cover crops in and also um, try to underseed things as much as possible and that's kind of part of the tillage part is when you do something that's potentially bad how can we mitigate that and do more good out of it and that's maybe every time we do a tillage pass incorporate some sort of a cover crop and underseeding with it. Um, we want to intercrop as much as possible so diversity of species and I think there's a lot of ways now with new cleaning equipment and more awareness with the, with the intercropping um, from the buyer's perspective that we can integrate this into our farms profitably. And uh, we also think that part of the regenerative movement is also taking a closer look at our soils, doing more sap analysis on plants and really aiming towards the nutrient density side of the food production um, and really concentrating on the plant health so that which also has a link to the soil health. And um, basically their long-term goals are all affiliated with that. And what I wanted to get to is maybe sometimes we're overwhelmed as well with all these different changes that we're trying to push through to push soil health. But maybe what's the most important is that we just concentrate on the direction and not the speed and do things right. So this has kind of been the trend overall in soil organic matter overall everywhere in the world. Um, and we're, it's no different here. I mean, there's studies in the Red River Valley that we've lost 18 inches of topsoil in the last 60 years. And even though I think it's sort of plateauing in our area here, we're not quite as affected by soil organic matter losses recently, I think we can do a lot better. And on, especially in the organic side with the summer fallow kind of oat rotations and stuff like that, I think we can really improve those. And I think what's important to un understand for the rest of my presentation is what is soil organic matter composed of? And a large part of that is living organisms and stabilized organic matter that come from root exudates. The liquid carbon pathway, I think, is the key on the organic side to getting our soils regenerated. Um, plant, ro plant roots can actually build soil organic matter fast, 30, five to 30 times faster than the above ground biomass. And 70% of root exudates are actually affiliated with uh, stable organic matter. And I think this trial is kind of interesting because they showed just by putting biannual crops into the rotation and using basically an organic setting with no fertilizer, so not throwing the C to N ratio completely out of back and not using herbicides that 
even by producing less biomass, because everyone's, I think, always obsessed with above ground biomass. In just a basically three year rotation, they were able to increase soil organic matter quite a bit faster by 0.2% in an organic setting than they could in a conventional setting. And I think that's really telling to that carbon pathway in the soil and that diversity. Um, and kind of one of the fathers of the regenerative movement is Gabe Brown. And even in his situation, I think it took quite a bit of time until he really integrated diversity into his system, especially on the plant side, that his soil started changing. Uh, I don't know, the slide's changing fairly slowly here. I'm not sure why. So I just want to get into the practical side of things. How do we do this in our system? And for the, I, I think the easiest one is intercropping. Um, in most places in Manitoba, you will not find a single lentil. But I think by intercropping, it actually allow, gives us more opportunities through reduction in disease. And the first intercrop we did this year was lentils and flax. And in this intercrop, like it doesn't even add a lot of cost either. We only needed three and a half pounds of flax per acre to get a really good stand of flax. And they were seeded at about two inches deep and they almost germinated quicker than the lentils did. And this is what it looked like later. This is black lentils that are fairly short lentil. Um, and it stood everything up beautifully. Wherever the flax was, harvest was easier. Um, the, I think in terms of if this was organic, I think the yield would have been very respectable and the profitability, 1,500 pounds of black lentils. And with only three and a half pounds of flax seeded, it was over 200 pounds of flax per acre. Extremely interesting mix. And the rooting systems are, I think they mesh really well together. And this is kind of what the sample looked like. So in terms of marketability, it's also extremely easy for separating these crops. And it's something that we could uh, really look at on the organic side. Um, yeah, they keep changing really slowly, these slides. I'm not sure why. So, I think another thing we need to look at is not only just, uh, let's say, oats and peas, but also the varieties. So we did uh, oats with Austrian winter peas, and this is on an inch and a half of rain. It went over 90 bushels of oats and 15 bushels of Austrian winter peas. And what was curious is on the field beside it, we had oats with yellow peas. And the oats with the yellow peas, which we used as a plow down in the end, looked like they had 30 or 40 pounds at least less nitrogen than the oats did with Austrian winter peas. And so I think there's, when we're looking at intercrops, we have to get a lot more creative with what varieties we are using and figuring out, I'm not sure why there is a better symbiosis, but it's uh, something that was quite noticeable. And the flag leaves on the oats when they were with the, um, with the peas were probably double the size than even on our conventional side with 80 to 90 pounds of nitrogen. Um, what's also interesting is what, uh, when I was talking to General Mills is they're starting to find that in an oat pea situation, the plumpness of the kernels and even the protein of the oats itself is starting to go up. And it's not something they can say conclusively yet, but it's something they're starting to see in many trials. And that's something that we can probably push later. There's a lot of plant protein plants going up. And is there gonna be influences? Because there's not only gonna be just pea protein extraction plants, there's one for canola coming up now. Is it the same case in a peola situation or with mustard, et cetera? Pea barley was another successful one. I mean, on an inch and a half of rain, it did a lot poorer in terms of yield, about 45 bushels of barley and 10 bushels of peas. But for a marketing perspective, I think it's another big opportunity, especially for feed. People are looking for feed. We managed to market this directly to a, a dairy barn and they took it as a mix and like they absolutely loved it because they're always looking for fiber and protein when they only have silage corn. And this is on a conventional side, but I think there's no reason why in Manitoba we can't do the same thing with mustard. This is the intercrop that I think over yields 
the most out of any mix, and that's a brassica with a legume. In Quebec, I have friends that say that their best organic soybean crops are when they have wild mustard pressure in their soybeans. And I think it's the same thing in the piola or pea mustard scenario. It is the only field where we did not have flea beetle pressure on our farm this year. Um, and just the overall canopy and competitivity of this mix is actually amazing to look at. But what was also interesting is the effect on the root systems. So the intercropped peas had a much more developed root system than peas in a monocrop situation. The peas on the, on the bottom of this slide were from a neighbor in a monocrop situation, and the other ones from, were from our intercrop, the top. So, and those pictures are three weeks apart. The nodulation and the root development different is huge. And what effect does that have with the carbon pathway in our soil? To, and are we bridging a gap maybe on some fungi when uh, we're growing so many brassicas that are really only have affiliations with bacteria? Those are all things that are kind of hard to say right now, but I think in the long term we can have, long ter we can have really great benefits to our soil and to our bottom line. It's just another example to show how much easier harvestability becomes too with these intercrops. We were scared of harvest before, uh, with the first time we tried intercropping, but actually in every single case, it's actually made harvest easier. In, in this case, where we're going for sprouting on the peas, the canola actually buffer the peas, and you have less cracked peas. In the oats and uh, pea situation, it's very easy to thrash out both of them together. And in the flax and lentil situation, some of the bulbs are a little bit hard to thrash out, but it stood all the lentils up and it made, wherever there was no flax, it was a nightmare to scrape them off the ground. So I think there's a lot of side benefits, but the biggest benefit is to our bottom line. This is just showing a picture of how simple it can be. You don't need an expensive setup to do intercropping and to separate the grain and to market them. It's just an easy, quick clean or rotary screen for most cases, if you set them up correctly, can, can do more than a, a, a good enough job. But the biggest, the most interesting thing is the ROI. And this is in a conventional setting, but our piola yielded about 40 bushels of peas and 15, 14 bushels of canola. And that's non-GMO canola versus uh, GM canola we had two and a half times the profitability per acre and we went through that field less we only one herbicide and basically no fertilizer so that's very much applicable to the organic side and this is just uh, planning for next year and theoretical but i think we can have those same targets on the organic side i think there's no reason why and i think some of these yields are fairly conservative for our potential but I feel like there's no reason why we can't hit $900 an acre revenue on some intercrops on the organic side. It's just, I think we have to be ready to market them openly and uh, try and push our buyers to take it. Uh, and I think that's what's interesting on the general mill side is, I know a lot of buyers are not taking pea and oats, but they can actually clean the peas out 100% on their end in their own plant in Minneapolis. So the plan going forward is, is to actually be able to accept pea oats as a mix at their processing plants, even up here, and forcing some of their buyers to take it as a mix. And as long as we keep pushing them as farmers to, to go this way, I think we can make it happen. And then I wanted to get back to the tillage point. So for every tillage piece of tillage that we do, we have to think about, okay, we might be damaging certain structures of the soil or certain microbial activity in the top portion or making the soil naked for a little bit, but maybe we, we should just think about it differently. And for every bad thing, we make up for it with a good thing. So underseeding with clovers, I think, well, in our situation, the only clovers that worked in the last two years were sweet clover in these dry conditions. But I think there's a lot we can do there. And I think with some light in-crop tillage also gives us a lot of opportunities on the back end. Because if we're not pre-working as much and we're not seeding end of May, 
I think we have a lot of opportunities for cover crops later in the season. And I'll show you here. So on the left hand side, I'll have a video here playing of, we had some winter kill and some fall rise, so we underseeded the, uh, the headlands with sweet clover, where the fall rye was gone, the sweet clover was over three and a half feet tall. And in the areas where it, there was fall rye, it just hovered below and then really took off once we finally got some rains at the end of August. Um, and the amazing part about that was with basically not having tilled that field for a year and a half and having underseeded it with sweet clover, when we got six inches of rain in one day in September, I could walk in that field and there was not a single puddle. This is, uh, the next one is kind of interesting because this is a multi-species cover crop seeded the first week of August. So it was after another cover crop, but it doesn't mean, because most of our harvest for any winter crop, so like winter wheat, fall rye, etc., is already done by end of July. So why can't we grow the same kind of cover crop after one of those crops and maybe we should just plan our rotations differently and um, it's a it was a mix of sorghum sedan grass buckwheat phacelia and a few other smaller grain stuff but it did extremely well in those conditions and then winter killed immediately with the first frost middle of september unfortunately we couldn't till it in so it's still there in the field but i've never seen as many prairie chickens and deer in our fields as I have this year, sometimes herds of 50 to 60. But, uh, oh yeah, and there was also annual vetch in there, which really took off after those rains in September and grew all the way into the, it was green until about the end of November underneath the snow. And you, you can't really see it, I think, in this picture, but you can see some uh, mycelia or you can see some fungi growing on some of the straw coming from the roots in this situation and I think there's definitely ways of making this work on our uh, in our climate and in our soils um, this is just a soil biology so a basically a biological activity test that we did comparing some different fields and so I think it's not enough to just intercrop what we're, by what we're going to see here you can see the CO2 result, and that's the respiration, the biorespiration in the soil. And this is after the multi-species, this is actually inside the multi-species cover crop this test was done. And this is done after pea oats. So I think the pea oats help, but it's, it's not enough. We need to keep root cover going, and we need to integrate, I think, biannuals more into our situation, because you can see that just a month later how that CO2 respiration dropped off from when we harvested the peyotes to when we did this soil sample, and these were sampled at the same time. Um, these are just more soil tests that show the same thing, but uh, I think overall, uh, as organic farmers, we do also have to pay attention to our soil nutrition, and I know we can't just concentrate on NPK, but we can concentrate on micronutrients, and we can push our crops so that they're more resilient to diseases and then maybe we can grow wider diversity of uh, crops in our rotation if we do that. Uh, sap analysis I think is something that can have a really big future as well in uh, organic farming. Comparing what old growth leaves to new growth leaves have in lacking in nutrients what nutrients are mobile, what nutrients are immobile, and how they're stealing them from different, so mobile nutrients will get stolen from the old leaves, brought to the new leaves, but that will, you'll lose the yield from that later on in the cropping season, and what are the fundamental issues that correlate between that sap analysis and our soil test, and can we fix some of those? Can we fix maybe our calcium to magnesium ratio, which might change like let's say if we add more calcium, will it change and flocculate our soils a little bit more and allow that biology to really take off and thrive because it has a more oxygen rich environment? These are the things we want to try on our farm and see if they have a place in the, new, in the regenerative and organic model. And I think these are like the goals that we would have. This just shows you that um, through cover crops, having perennials, in your cropping system versus 
the same field right beside it with just a corn soy rotation, the difference we can have in drier years and drier conditions like we had last year. And we definitely saw on our own farm that wherever, especially on the organic side, wherever we had intercrops or wherever we had cover crops, it just did not seem to get affected by the drought as much. And this was my foray into uh, animal <laughs> production incorporation into our farm. But uh, I think we, as grain farmers, um, I think we need to look for opportunities with neighbors and see if we can graze, whether it be chickens all the way to cows through some of our cover crops and really make it worth our while to in incorporate this into our rotations and really change the root structures in, in our soil situations. And this is just a list of courses and books that kind of inspired our farm. And uh, yeah, to not do what this guy is doing in the video and just spray blindly <laughs> without thinking of the repercussions. And uh, yeah, sorry about uh, all the confusion before and the lack of transition from the General Mills uh, presentation to uh, this one, but uh, I think General Mills means really well, and they're, I think, going to be a really big help for us going forward and pushing some of the intercrop movement and things like that and making it more mainstream. Thank you. I have a question for Alex. Oh, good, right, I see you. Can you touch on some of the tools you use for in-crop weed management of your pea intercrops? The, or, the organic pea intercrops? Yeah, um, basically what we've been using is, uh, instead of pre-working in the spring, we've uh, kind of gone in with a tine weeder, about, uh, probably about four or five days before seeding, kind of tickled the top, trying to get uh, some of the weed seeds germinated and then we'll go right after seeding we'll go again with that same tool and blind harrow maybe a day or two after seeding and then we'll wait until the crops a little bit more established and go in when it's maybe three leaf stage or two leaf stage and we usually go in and interrow cultivate and then if necessary we'll harrow kind of right afterwards one more time and then let the crop go and that harrowing after the interrow cultivation is just so that any weeds that we kind of clip with the edge of the interrow cultivator knife that don't quite get pulled out, we kind of rip them out with the harrow. And surprisingly, peas are extremely resilient to harrowing. You touched on talking about uh, selecting var specific varieties for intercrops. And uh, I'm just curious about maybe some, si some examples of success you've had with that. You gave one if there's others or, and also where you source some of that maybe more unique seed um, varieties maybe that aren't just fo focused on monoculture yields? Yeah, that's a really good question. Um, so far, like, uh, we've kind of seen it on the Piola side where I think the maple peas over yield more than let's say yellow peas would from, uh, I guess they're monocrop yields, um, and on that token, uh, it didn't really matter which variety it was. We kind of saw the same thing and ended up to the same yield. But uh, um, yeah, it's hard to, in terms of sourcing those. I think uh, there's still a lot of forage uh, companies that still use some of those other varieties uh, for, I guess, more feed scenarios and stuff like that, and. Um, and I think there's also some uh, universities that are doing research in between, well, we were talking with Martin Enns before, leaf and semi-leafless peas. And, uh, but other than that, in terms of synergies between varieties, I haven't seen any other examples on my own farm yet, but I can only imagine from those two examples that there will be other ones. Um, and I think uh, maybe going forward, it'd be good to have breeding kind of oriented towards intercropping. Hi, Alex, this is for you. For um, do you uh, save your own seed for, for these, for these uh, intercrops that you're using? Or are, when you're changing to a different variety, are you 
bringing in a new seed and then kind of starting your data on the new seed that you brought in and then following it to see if it changes to adapt to your, your soil biome. Yeah, haven't been doing it long enough. So far, we're keeping our own seed now. Um, so over the next, so it's only been two or three years on certain crops. So I'll be able to tell you, I guess, in five or ten years. <laughs> I don't know, but uh, yeah, so far it's we've kept our own seed though. 